。はい。Um, I, I'm Zach Nunn, if you didn't know me, but I bet all of you do.、Um, I spent my summer in San Diego. I was working at SDSU, San Diego State University,、uh, doing something with microbiology with Yan Wei in the rower lab. And、um, I really didn't know what that would entail when I first got there. I、uh, live with David Greenlee, he's a lawyer,、um, a bachelor lawyer. In Kensington, and、uh, he ate out a lot, so he'd come home at like 11 o'clock and there was no food in the house.、Um, but he had a nice house. <laughs>、um, I had a bike about half an hour to 45 minutes each day to the campus, so there's my、uh, bike route.、Um, I、uh, Biked home on that route on some pretty,、uh, pretty big roads, multi lane highways, and then I went to the campus a different way because there was less traffic and I didn't want to get hit by a car.、Um, and then I did some other things too, like I went for runs. There's me on top of a hill, and you can see parts of San Diego in the background, and that's、uh, the Kensington sign, the neighborhood where I lived. I also played soccer. I went to the largest biotech conference in the world in San Diego. I、uh, got to check out Comic Con, went to the zoo, went up to LA to visit my uncle for Fourth of July weekend,、um, did a whole bunch of stuff. I did a race with David.、Um, he got me into some racing. So we did an aquathon to raise money. I think it was for cancer. So it was a mile swim and then a 10K run on the beach. And、uh, my running time was faster than my swimming time, which was, I guess, I, I'm a good runner. I'm a terrible swimmer, I guess. Is, that's what it means.、Um, and we also got into some paddling. He was a paddler. He, was for the, he、uh, raced on the San Diego Outrigger Canoeing Club. And so I did some of that. I practiced a couple times a week and、uh, went to a race in that as well and took third place. Um, and then lastly, the eating.、Uh, that's the farmer's market in San Diego. It's pretty famous. And like I said, there was no food in the house. So I had to go to like the 15 blocks of the store, or sometimes I was too lazy and I decided to go to the neighborhood pizza place. Or、um, sometimes I just didn't eat at all. I was too lazy to even leave the house. Um, okay, so the science. That's why I was there. Um, I got to the lab in the beginning. Like I said, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know for sure who I was working with.、Um, I had to go over the safety procedures. I had to learn everything, even the most elementary things that they knew. I didn't know, like, what's a pipette? That is a pipette. <laughs> And those are the tips. It、uh, transfers liquids. So, like in chemistry, when you transfer, I don't know, a couple. 200 milliliters into this and 100 milliliters of that, and try and make something. Well, in microbiology, instead of doing 100 milliliters, you use one one thousandth of a milliliter. You use a microliter. So、uh, that's what those pipettes are for transferring really, really small amounts of liquids to and from things.、Um, I worked with Yan Wei during my eight weeks. She's a cystic fibrosis scientist. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition that、uh, it affects the transport proteins in epithelium cells. So, what happens in the lungs, which is the most, where all the problems arise,、um, is that chlorine ions can't pass through the epithelium, and a bunch of mucus builds up on the outside of the cells inside the lungs. So, you have a bunch of mucus in your lungs, and then the mucus breeds bacteria. And、uh, cystic fibrosis patients, they have to chronically fight off lung、uh, diseases until they die.、Um, the average lifespan is about 41 years, so they don't live very long because they succumb to like, these lung diseases. So, what cystic fibrosis people do, cystic fibrosis scientists, sorry, they,、uh, they're, not trying to cu- they're not trying to cure cystic fibrosis, they're just trying to find ways to have the people live better, kill the bacteria more quickly. More、uh, better ways to kill the bacteria, I should say.、Um, there's Yang Wei. 
using a nano drop, as you heard from uh, Sabina, um, showing me how to do it. And uh, I started off wanting to learn what all this was about, how to do experiments, getting used to the lab. So my first experiment, my hypothesis was um, bacteria in cystic fibrosis patients will be more genetic resistant to antibiotics than uh, bacteria in someone without cystic fibrosis, for instance. And I came up with this because uh, cystic fibrosis patients, they take antibiotics every single day of their lives just to fight off the bacteria. So it's a pretty basic hypothesis um, for just to get me started. So I took some samples from myself, um, kind of like a strep test. I took a swab of my throat, spread it on some Petri dishes. I used a couple different kinds to get a couple different types of bacteria. And then uh, isolated certain types from there, from my Petri dishes. And this is what it kind of looked like. On each side is two different kinds. And each circle is a uh, bacteria colony, hundreds, millions of cells. Um, that came from one cell that just reproduced over and over. So each colony is a uh, genetically identical colony. Um, and then I sequenced the uh, DNA from the bacteria to find out what kind of what they were. And I did kind of what Sabina would do. I went through uh, polymerase chain reactions. I used agarose gels. I, did all this stuff to get the DNA sequencing that I don't have time to explain. <laughs> but I got this, which talked about the uh, species. And so I got a couple different types of species, Streptococcus, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, Enterococcus, um, a whole bunch of types of bacteria and how well it matched to the data bank. And then I actually, after I knew what everything was, I could begin my experiments. So I did some growth curves, which measured the, uh, the extent of growth of the bacteria over time, of like 24 hours, for example. Um, and I wanted to test the growth under the presence of antibiotics. So the first one I used was gentamicine. It targets the ribosomes in the bacteria cells. So the, the bacteria have DNA, the DNA codes for RNA, and the RNA goes into the ribosomes to make the proteins that the cell uses to carry out its functions. And so what the gentamicine does is it stops the ribosomes from making proteins, and hopefully that will kill the cells. So here's some pictures of me making my 96 well plates, and each well has about 500 microliters of liquid in there. That's Five, I mean, not 500, 50 microliters. 50 microliters is 1 20th of a milliliter. So really, really small amounts. And then you had to keep everything under a flame when you were doing the, uh, the transferring because the flame stopped the uh, other things from getting in. You didn't want there to be any contamination. So my first experiments with gentamicine, they failed. I even tried it again with gentamicine, and those failed too. Uh, Ultimately, the gentamicin wasn't strong enough to kill the bacteria, so I tried this new antibiotic called carbonicillin, uh, penicillin-based, and I uh, got this kind of data. So you can see, for samples uh, 32, 33, and 34, they're from, from myself, someone without cystic fibrosis, and you can see how the carbonicillin killed them off at all the concentrations except zero, and then uh, for the Pseudomonas 1 and 8 and the Staphylococcus 25 samples from a cystic fibrosis patient, you can see that uh, it didn't kill it off nearly as well. Um, and then I actually did something called cell counts and more in-depth process trying to figure out exactly how many cells are in each after. Um, so I played something like that, more pictures. And uh, not all of them worked. You can see here in this uh, bottom, bottom left-hand picture, not all the, uh, the lines, like there are supposed to be different amount of cells per each line because they're different dilutions, but they're all kind of the same, and it's because there is contamination or because I wasn't careful enough with my, di my diluting. Um, so you got to be careful of that. You've got to be really precise. And then the one above it, it's glowing. That's a, a type of bacteria that produces something that fluoresces. 
under ultraviolet light, which is kind of cool to see. And then after that, I used some artificial sputum. So the cells in the cystic fibrosis patient's lungs, they live in the mucus, not in like a lab-produced liquid. So I wanted to mimic the environment in the lungs by making this artificial sputum. It's like a mixture of a whole bunch of things, um, salmon sperm DNA for uh, nucleic acids and some other things. And it looks like this goop. So I tried the exper same experiment again, except in this goop. And there's some of my plates. And then there's more glowing, uh, glowing bacteria. And then I even wrote my name. I uh, spread, spread my name on the plates. And, um, and here's some graphs and stuff. And it, you can see how um, the, uh, the antibiotics did work for samples 33, the healthy sample, and the staphylococcus. But it did not work, and it made the bacteria grow better in sample eight, the pseudomonas. And I'll get to that later, but it was kind of interesting to see, like, oh my god, the, the antibiotics made the cells grow more. Um, so I tried the last experiment was with hyperbaric oxygen, because the whole time we want to find better ways to kill the bacteria. And so Yan Wei, the pers the, my mentor, was experimenting with hyperbaric oxygen treatments. Hyperbaric oxygen is kind of like what you use when you go scuba diving to really great depths. You go into a chamber that's high pressure, 100% oxygen. And so experimenting with this type of treatment to kill the bacteria, because the antibiotics we were using, they target the oxygen pathways of the cells. When the bacteria breathe oxygen, the uh, antibiotics enter them. When they don't breathe oxygen, it doesn't enter them. And a lot of these bacteria, they can breathe other things besides oxygen. So we're forcing them to breathe oxygen, forcing the antibiotics into them to see if that would kill them better. Um, so my, that was my hypothesis, that using this type of treatment would work more. Um, and then here are my graphs. And you can see how they worked for the staphylococcus for both the cystic fibrosis samples and the healthy sample. Oops. Um, but not for the Pseudomonas samples. And um, Pseudomonas is the most difficult type of bacteria to kill in the world. Um, I was told this afterwards, but... Um, and you can see the, uh, they actually grew better with the antibiotic. And there's a couple of reasons why, or that I thought this was. Um, number one, is that carbonicillin has a sugar part of it, so it's a antibiotic, but it has a sugar base. And so the Pseudomonas could be so resistant to the antibiotic that they could take the sugar, use it to grow better, and use it as food, and uh, throw out the toxic parts. Um, the other part of it was hyperbaric oxygen forces them to breathe oxygen. That's the most efficient way to breathe, the most efficient way to get energy. So that probably made them grow better as well. And then lastly, a lot of bacteria, they, uh, they grow when they're stressed out. So when they're stressed out as a defense mechanism, they grow, they reproduce more to kind of overcome their stress or something. And so those three causes together, or a combination of them or whatever, made the pseudomonas grow more with the carbonicillin. And so if I wanted to do more experiments in the future, I would find out exactly how the stress would work with the uh, Pseudomonas, and I'd also use concentrations of antibiotic way beyond what you'd normally use on a human. I used 2,000 micrograms per milliliter of uh, carbonicillin in that experiment, but I used 20,000 or 100,000 micrograms per milliliter just to see uh, where the uh, Pseudomonas would die. And then um, I'd, of course, be more careful because... A lot of my experiments, a lot of my plates, there was contamination, there was uneven diluting, and so I'd have to be more careful with that, like always. Um, thanks to Yan Wei and the entire rower lab, and then thanks for Pinhead. I mean, they, they sent me there, so. And thanks for Nana for uh, getting me in contact with these people, and thanks for David for hosting me, and thank you to everyone.